Amen. Let's read the scripture. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, which are angelic beings, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke, which is the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory. And you know, Isaiah has a very interesting response. You know, being in the glory and man, seeing the seraphim and just this uh, amazing, you know, procession going on of, of, of glory, glory, glory. And then Isaiah has this response. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me and with a live coal in the hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar with it he touched my mouth and said see this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away I said your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for then and only then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then Isaiah responds and says, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. The title of my message today is settling your yesterday and seeing your tomorrow. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for every person here. Spirit of God, I pray you speak to each and every one of us individually and profoundly that your anointing be in this house and as we stand in your presence may we walk away never the same we thank you lord for your word may we have open hearts open ears in jesus name amen amen why don't you look to the person next to you and say so good to see you <laughs> so let me ask you this have you ever gotten an injury before and tried to work through it you know, tried to function as normal, even though you had that injury. Has anybody gone through that? I mean, you know, how'd that work out for you? Not so good, right? You, you, you know, you hurt yourself. You go back to work the next day thinking that, you know, you could get over it, but you don't. Or, you know, like me, I injured my shoulder because we went on vacation and, you know, we went hiking. Who goes hiking on vacation? That was my husband's idea. You know, <laughs> on the way down, of course, my, my, my six-year-old daughter didn't want to, um, you know, walk all the way down. She was wearing the wrong shoes because I didn't plan to go hiking on vacation, you know. But anyway, he wanted to do it, and we thanked him afterwards. It was great. But I had to carry her down the whole way on my back and my backpack in my front. So I injured my shoulder for a period of time. So anyway, we get back from vacation, and I overate, and I had a great time. So I definitely had to hit that gym. I'm at the gym, and you know, how many know about those rowers? Anybody ever been on those rowers at the gym? Hello? Yeah, so my instructor's going around, and I'm, I'm on the rowers, and of course, you know, I, uh, I got my injured shoulder, but I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it, okay? So she comes up, and of course, she, she points me out, you know, and she's like, Marie, what are you doing? I said, I'm rowing. <laughs> you know, but the problem was that I was hunching my back, you know, um, I, was, I was compensating for my shoulder, I was pulling the bar back wrong, I was all discombobulated, and you know, like, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do it right if you're hurt, you know? <laughs> and she said, you know, Marie, she says, to, and they have little microphones too, so she's just putting me on blast, you know? She goes, Marie, you need to correct your form. Okay, <laughs> you know? And as I tried to plow through, my instructor said, she said this, and I'll never forget, and I had to write it down because I thought it was quite profound. She says, when you're tired and weak, the first thing you lose is your form. And when you're not in the correct form, you lose power and effectiveness. And I needed my shoulder to get healed first so it can work with the rest of my body to keep the form. Is anybody getting me here? And it made me think, how we lose power 
and effectiveness in our lives because we are compensating for the hurt that we have. You're compensating for the hurt that you have. That's why you can't love your kids the way that you want to love your kids because you didn't get loved the way your mom loved you. So you're compensating for the hurt in other areas, but somebody's going to be able to say, that's just not the right form. You're trying to live out your Christianity and your walk, and you know, you're trying to love on people. You're trying to look like you have the blessed life, but you know, you're hurting inside. And there's something wrong with your posture. You're hurting. You have the wrong form. How are we going to write a powerful future when our past leaves us powerless? Some of you are watching online right now and you're connecting with this word right now and you're saying, I feel powerless sometimes. You're here right now and you're saying, I feel powerless, but I'm not sure how to pinpoint where that power is going from. It's coming from the guilt, the sin and shame those are what I call power leaks in our lives. They make you lose good form. Trying to stand through test and trial, trying to fulfill the call of God in your life, trying to keep your sanity, but you haven't been effective. You just feel like you can't get ahead because you haven't dealt with your power leak. And if you don't settle your yesterday, you can't see your tomorrow. You see, in the scriptures we just read, Isaiah is in a similar situation. King Isaiah had died and there was no leadership. And this was back in the year 740 BC. So, you know, there was a lot of fear when a king died because the fate of the people was unknown. There was uncertainty about the future. And here's Isaiah wondering what's going to happen. And then he has this vision. So he's kind of, you know, in this posture, in this place. And he's saying, you know, uh, King Uzziah has died. And then boom, he has this vision and encounter with God. And right when you think this experience is going to fill him with power, right when the seraphim are saying, holy, 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 right when he sees the throne of God, right when he's in the presence of God just permeating around him, right when he's saturated into that, into that moment, instead of joining and saying, wow, I'm in the presence of God, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, but instead it exposes his power leak. And you can nearly hear the posture change as he speaks words of defeat over himself. He begins to feel the weight of his humanity, the weight of his pain and guilt, the weight and overwhelmed by his shame. And in his state of unworthiness, he disqualifies himself to do the work of the Lord. And I'm going to read from the NLT, but verse five, this is his response. He says, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. What Isaiah is trying to say is, who am I? Who am I to be in the presence of God? Who am I to be used by God? I have a dirty past. I'm unclean. I'm messed up. There has to be someone better. Why would you appear to me, God, in your presence? I don't feel better. I, 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 feel, I feel unworthy. It's exposing my humanity. It's exposing my sin. And there was a whole kingdom left waiting for a leader to rise up and lead, waiting for a word of hope for their future. And Isaiah appears to be the man to speak into their lives, but he tells God in so many words, I'm not your man because I'm sinful. How many of us have said similar words? I've said similar words. Walking in Christ, trying to plow through some hurt sometimes, and then you're in the presence, you're like, whoa, 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 I don't think I'm your person. Maybe that other person. You know, the word God says to prefer your brother, but sometimes we don't prefer our brother because we're being humble. We prefer them because we feel guilty, because we don't feel equipped. We don't feel qualified. Who am I, Lord? I'm a man of unclean lips. He felt his yesterday held him back. So God cleanses him. And I want to talk to you today about allowing God to settle your yesterday so you can step into writing your tomorrow. Because you can't write tomorrow if you can't see it. 
And this isn't as easy as it sounds to just let God have full access to your most deepest, darkest secrets. I'm talking about stuff that maybe your spouse doesn't even know. I'm talking about mind battles that the person that's next to you has no idea that you go through. I'm talking about the deep things right now. That you don't, that nobody knows that you rehearse in your mind that disqualify you on a daily basis. But if you don't deal with it, your inner thoughts and sins and all that shame and guilt, if you don't deal with it, it will deal with you. The enemy's goal of sin in your life is to paralyze the believer. He will tempt you. He will torment you. He will harass you because his goal is to dismantle your yes to God. And here's three points, three ways to settle your yesterday so you can write your future. Three ways that I see that in Isaiah 6, to settle your yesterday so you can write your future. Are you ready for point number one? Number one, get into the manifest presence of God. Get into the manifest presence of God. Isaiah 6.1, it says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted. This Isaiah talking. He's, and this is the beginning text. And uh, I saw... Uh, King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He's there saying, God, I want to put myself in a posture for you to speak into my life. So Isaiah presented himself, and he was in a posture, and boom, he has this encounter with God. He got into a place where the Lord started speaking to him. And it's not enough to be just around the presence of God. You have to let the things of God in you. See, you're in the presence of God, but is the manifest presence of God taking place in your life? And what I mean by that is, for example, my husband and I, we could be in the same restaurant. I could be sitting there, but he could be sitting over there and we'll never interact. We're in the same room, but we never connected. How as opposed to having the manifest presence of being together is having dinner together talking together, looking into each other's eyes, having full conversation, eating each other's food, and looking and say, and, and, and having that time with each other. That is the manifest presence. Some of you are here even right now. Some of you have come to church for a long time. Some of you are, you know, uh, try to get into your prayer closet, but you're just around the presence, but you haven't experienced the manifest presence of God. There were a lot of people around Jesus as he walked this earth, but not everyone was able to personally encounter him. In Genesis 28, 16, Jacob said he was in the presence of God and didn't even know it. Like the woman with the issue of blood, she touched his garment and was instantly healed even though there were many people bumping into Jesus. Even his disciples said, you know, because Jesus said, who touched me? And his disciples said, well, you know, Lord, there, there's many people around here touching you. But no, somebody tapped into the manifest presence of Jesus because Jesus said, somebody touched me because I felt power leave me. And you know, you, when you get into the presence of God, I want to challenge you today to not just be a bystander and say, I was in the presence of God, but step into the manifest presence and say, God, speak to me. Lord, while the word is going on, speak to me. Lord, minister to me. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, look into my soul. Look into my spirit. I give you full access. Look into my spiritual eyes. And, you know, she experienced the manifest presence of God. And what I'm saying is, you're not going to settle your yesterdays by clocking in and out of church. You'll settle them by being in the manifest presence of God. There are very practical ways to get in the manifest presence of God. And you know, let me, you know, there are very practical ways. But uh, another thing is, you know, you could be in a worship service and you could be seeing, looking at the worship leader. But until you close your eyes, until you have a moment and you're able to lift your hands if you're able to, or however you like to worship the Lord, there's different, there's many different stances you can do, you know. But until you submit and say, I, man, Lord, I am worshiping you right now. Because you're glorious instead of just kind of looking at the whole presentation. You're in it. You're in it. Or when the word is being preached, you're not just sitting there. You're leaning in and saying, God, I know you're going to speak to me today. How many come saying, I need a word from the Lord today? I need a word from the Lord today. 
But there's very practical ways. You can start by opening your Bible. Sometimes we complicate it so much, but let me tell you, it's quite simple. Just opening your Bible. When you start reading it more than just on a Sunday morning and you're home and you start reading, now you're inviting the manifest presence of God. And let me tell you that when you're in the manifest presence of God, even though, you know, I'm in my little closet, because that's, that's where I go. I go in my little, my little closet. I have this little spot in my closet. It's facing all my shoes and my jackets are behind me. And I have just this little spot. There's no air conditioning in your closet. But that is my moment to tap into the presence of God. I just get in there and I say, Lord, I need to hear from you. Lord, I want you. Lord, I'm just going to make myself completely vulnerable to you right now. I'm, even though my daughter's crawling on my head and, you know, I'm trying to pray and things like that. The, the, we have to get into places. We have to have a secluded place where we say, God, this is my time with you. Open your Bible. You know, and then, man, how many, how many moms we have here? You know, sometimes we, we get a little frustrated with our kids. For those of you who have small kids, or maybe, you know, some grandmas, they, they watch their grandkids too. But sometimes, you know, oh, we just get a little frustrated with our kids. And man, I have moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, my kids are frustrating me. Or all of a sudden, I'm like a short fuse. And I'll just start yelling at my kids about everything. I mean, everything, you know. And then before you know it, I'm just nagging my husband and getting on his case about everything. And that doesn't last very long because he's not like that, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, he'll tell me, and my husband, I love him so much. He's very honest with me. He'll, he'll be like, you know... You, First, you need to chill, you know? <laughs> and second of all, second of all, it sounds like you need to get in the presence of God. And I know that might sound pretty funny, but you know what? He's absolutely right. And as much as I want to buck at it, and as much as I want to reject it, and as much as I want to say, no, I'm just mad because, you know, you haven't taken the trash out. And I've been wanting to tell you, but now I finally, you know, I'm just saying something about it. So I'm frustrated. It's like, no, 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 you're not mad at me. You're mad because you haven't settled something with the Lord. You need to go in there. You're mad at me. You're mad at the kids. You're mad at everything. You're a short fuse. You're frustrated. Your anxiety level is going up. Your stress level is going up. And no matter how much trash we pick up, no matter how many clothes we pick up from the floor and put in the laundry, no matter how much we try to do, nothing is going to settle your spirit because you're not in alignment right now. So I'll go to my closet and I'll open my Bible and I'll start like this. <sighs> Whatever. All right. So I'm here. Am I going to change? Still hasn't taken the trash out kids still haven't put their laundry away. I'm going to get up. It's all still going to be there. Ugh, you know, and you're just, I'm just like going through. I'm in my hot closet and I'm looking through and, you know, playing Bible roulette. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I start reading the word of God. All of a sudden I start worshiping God. And this happens every time as if it's not predictable to me today. I still walk in stomping my feet sometimes. Come on, let's be real, right? Can I just be a little real with you today? So I'll get into my closet, and then all of a sudden, the Lord starts speaking to me. The Lord starts loving on me. I'm able to release to God just that anxiety, that extra stress that I've been holding because I'm entering into the manifest presence of God. And then, you know, and then after I read his word, I open my journal and I begin to write. And let me tell you something. It is true that when you're in the presence of God, things begin to change. Because once my attitude was at this level, and now because I'm able to release to God. Come on, some of you men, you also deal with anger. Some of you women deal with anger. Some of you have a short fuse. Some of you have some serious issues that you need to give to the Lord. Not just in therapy, even though that's important, but you also need to set time aside to have in your prayer time with the Lord and give it to God. You need a place to take it and you need to take it to the cross. And then the Lord does something with it. And then before you know it, I'm journaling and God starts speaking to me. And then I start prophesying over myself and saying, come on, get up, woman of God. I've called you for more than this. You're not going to be a frustrated woman. You're not going to be an anxiety type of mother. You're not going to have attitude around the house. You're not going to show your kids a woman that's not healed. Get up, woman of God. I'm calling you for greater things. You are above this. You are not beneath this. You are called for more. Yes, and let me tell you, it starts even in your own home. You think you have to get all right and pretty before you come to church? Oh no, 
When your feet hit that ground, your kids, your grandkids, your spouse, your friends are looking to see who you are. And this is who I am. I am a woman of God. You are a woman of God. You are a man of God. That's who you are. So make sure that you do what you need to do by getting in the presence of God to put all that in alignment because the enemy would love to get you out of sync with God and defeat you. Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you're there that we can go into your throne room and you're there to help us in our time of need. Let me ask you something. Where do you go when you are in your time of need? Do you pick up the phone? Do you start scrolling through social media and hoping that somebody wrote a nice quote that'll encourage you? Has that become your new Bible? Facebook, has that become your new Bible? Hopefully somebody just has an encouraging story. Oh no. You need to get out of Facebook and put your face in his book. Amen? (laughs) Ephesians 3.12, it says, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. In him and through faith, we can approach him with freedom and confidence. The sad thing is so many people do not approach God because they lack freedom and confidence. Instead, they have defeat and fear. But let me tell you something. Let me ask you this. What is God asking you to do? What is God speaking to you? And if your answer is, I don't know, then I want to tell you that's okay. But if you desire to know, then you need to get in the presence of God. Come boldly and confidently to the house of God, to the presence of God. But nothing, nothing, let me listen closely. Nothing will intimidate you more from coming to the throne of God than your guilt and sin. It'll hold you back. Second point, how to settle your yesterday so you can write your future. Confess your sin and guilt to the Lord. Confess your sin and guilt to the Lord. Isaiah said in verse five, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. Have you ever felt like yesterday's, that your yesterday's disqualified you from your tomorrow's? Ever felt like your past was chasing you down to your future? Or maybe we've allowed, because it's become comfortable, it's just become the norm, we've allowed our past to dictate our future. You know, I remember there was a time in my life where my yesterday held me back. I had this old mindset of disqualification. I was bullied in school. I had a lot of people say mean things to me. I grew up really insecure about myself, about my life. And you know what? When I didn't deal with it, that disqualifying mindset went into other areas of my life. It then went into my marriage, and then when I battled infertility and I felt like I couldn't give my husband children, I felt disqualified to be uh, his partner in life. And then when we started pastoring the church, I felt disqualified to co-pastor with him. And then when things progressed, I felt disqualified to even come before you today and preach and minister the word of God. If you don't deal with your old mindset of disqualification, You will stifle, delay, and hurt the future that God has for you and your family and all those that are connected to you. But the same way the manifest presence of God affirmed me to step into my role alongside my husband is the same way he'll affirm you to just take one step, join a connect group. Come on, joining a connect group, you're putting yourself out there. You're saying, hey, life is better with friends, but I need to make friends. Go make friends. Say, you know what? I, I, need, I need this. I need people in my life. Because a lot of people say this, here's my church and here's my friends. But God wants to bring that together. God wants, come on, we want, we not, we want to see Acts 2.42 happen in this church where we come together. Amen. Where revival is happening right here and in our homes and together with our families. And, you know, I just want to tell you today that your next step awaits you. 
But if you're held back by your past, you're always going to say no to the next step. Connect groups, growth track, growth track. Yeah, discover your purpose. Fulfill the call of God in your life. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, you know what? I don't even know if I'm there yet. Well, maybe there's some things that God wants to heal you from so that you can see a glimpse of a powerful future. First John chapter one, verses eight through nine, it says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Everybody has sin, every one of us. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. Thank you, Lord, for his faithfulness. Thank God that he's more faithful than I am. Thank God that he's wonderful and that he's perfect and that we can come to him and trust him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. You see, Jesus is the only one that can forgive you and I of our sins. His blood stains and covers every guilt, every shame. There is no going around. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. There's no other way. There's no other person. There's no other relationship. There's no other spouse. There's no other child. There's no other future. There's no other uh, job. There's no other status. There's no other drug. There's no other addiction. There's no wine bottle, no beer bottle, no special thing that all of a sudden is going to wipe it all away. Only Jesus can. But until you realize that you're the one that needs Jesus, until you realize that you're the one that needs to take that step into your future for yourself, then you're just going to continue to be who you are today. If you hang on to your pain, then your future is being written while you're hurt. If you write while you're hurt, you'll write your future hurt. If you write while you're hurt, you will write your future hurt. I'm lonely, so I'll hook up with this person right here. I'll hook up with the first person that comes along. I'll just, let's just hook up because I'm feeling lonely. You know, I went on Instagram and I see everybody, they're all hooking up. They all look happy. I'm the only one left alone. You know, I'm just going to go and hook up. <laughs> and then you have new hurt to get healed from because you tried to do something the wrong way. You tried to feel something the wrong way. You know, I'm mad at my spouse for hurting my feelings, so I'll give them the silent treatment. And now your marriage is suffering more than it did before. You've grown apart over a lack of communication. You've grown apart because of pride, and now there's more hurt. Oh, I, I, love, I love my wife, but I don't love her kids. Oh, I love my husband, but I don't love his kids. And you don't realize that to love your spouse is also meaning that you love everything that came from them. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You married it all when you said, I do. And if you don't love them, you are breeding more hurt. I was offended by the person two rows behind me. Woo. I step on anybody's toes there. And I'm wondering if church is even for me. So you'll dull your relationship with God in exchange for a right to be hurt. Leaving you desperate for an even score that you know isn't right. If you want the forgiveness with God, then there needs to be forgiveness in your heart as well. Cleansing of it all. Or else you'll continue the cycle of injury on injury, hurt for hurt, pain for pain, offense for offense, guilt for guilt, shame for shame. And let me tell you, that's what the enemy has for you. But God wants to get you from glory to glory, from the next level to the next level. Oh, come on. He wants to take you further, faster, more than you ever have before. But if you're carrying all this stuff, if you're held back by all the shame and guilt from your past, then there's no way that you can have an accelerated, uh, accelerated, multiplied future. And let me tell you, that's the epitome. When people don't get healed from their past, that's the epitome of bad advice. People who aren't healed giving you their opinion for your life, 
Who do you go to? Who do you go to when you're in need of advice, when you're in need of someone to speak into your life? Are you going to someone who's healed? Let me tell you, that's what connect groups are for. So that you can do life with people and say, I need help right now, but I, I don't need your opinion. I need a biblical perspective. I don't need you to celebrate me or applaud me or tell me how proud you are of me. What I need is prayer. What I need is the word of God. And I need you to partner with me in Jesus' name. You can't write your future if you're stuck reading your past. You'll get writer's block. You'll just stop right there and you won't know what to write because you can't write what you don't see. And Isaiah writes of the moment his guilt was taken. In verses 6 through 7 of Isaiah 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim, which is an angelic being that hovers around the throne of God, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And all the weight, all the baggage was off of Isaiah and he was ready to do the work of the Lord. He was ready to say yes to anything that God asked of him. Which leads me to my last point, how to settle your yesterday so you can write your future. God presents you an opportunity for your future. When you're all clear in here, in here, and in here, in your mind, and your heart, then you're receptive to the call of God. Because in God, your opportunity will become your mandate. But before God gives direction, he asks him this question, whom shall I send and who will go for us? God is asking Isaiah, hey Isaiah, whom should I send and who should go for us? And when God speaks this to Isaiah and asks him this, Isaiah, after being cleansed of his guilt, and only after he's been cleansed of his guilt, is able to respond. Instead of saying, woe is me, I'm not your man, I'm a sinful man, I'm a sinful woman, I messed up, I'm disqualified, don't even look at me. Instead, because he was cleansed of his guilt and his sin was atoned for, he was able to respond boldly and with confidence and say, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And some of you are here today and some of you are watching online and you desperately, desperately want to say, here am I, send me. Whenever pastor is up here and he's speaking about the future. Oh, come on, we have another campus coming up. We have Costa Mesa coming up. Oh, we need all hands on the plow. We need all hands on deck. We need people to sow into this. We need people to believe in this. We need people to want to see other people get breakthrough and healing in their lives. Oh, but if you're all hung up, if you're all hung up, you'll think that you're not a part of it. You'll see the procession go in front of you and you'll just be a bystander. But God wants you to get in on it. He's saying, who will go? Will you? Will you? And you know, sometimes when God is saying, who will go? It's saying, just, what's the call of God? Be a good husband. Be a husband that leads your family to breakthrough, to healing. Be a mom that loves her kids and speaks life over them. Be a wife that speaks life to her husband. You know, the call of God starts at home. It starts at home. Before you come here and you try to put a face on and your kids resent you later. It starts at home. I know that, I've seen it before. Where the kids will resent the parents because they're one person outside of the home but they're a whole different person inside. The wife resents the husband. The husband resents the wife because they leave the house and they're a whole different person when they come home. Oh yeah, I'm glad she's nice to you, but when she comes home, <laughs> you know? You're not gonna be able to whole wholeheartedly say, here am I, send me. You'll see the pattern in your life. Being in the presence of God will expose that to you first. But if you want the fullness of God, if you want more of God, if you want the call of God manifested in your life. You gotta get in His presence. You gotta ask Him to cleanse you of all guilt. And listen, God is looking for your yes. God is looking for your yes. James 4, 8 from the message, it says, say a quiet yes to God and He'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. I love James. This is the brother of Jesus. He's just very bold, very, he does not sugarcoat anything. <laughs> 
you know, he's like, quit, quit it. Stop all this nonsense. Just say yes to God. Because listen, hanging on to all that stuff is not worth it in the end. And God isn't just looking for your yes. He's looking for a yes. And what I mean by that, I love what Pastor Josiah says. He says, God's plans will always prevail. God's plan will always prevail. He has a plan. He's looking for people that are willing to say yes. So can God count on you among those who are willing to go through the process of healing, the process of confession, the process of even dying to yourself and saying, yeah, I got issues. Yeah, I have secrets. Let me tell you, you're only as sick as your secrets. You're only as sick as your secrets. And God's looking for people that are sick and tired of being sick of their secrets, of their skeletons in the closet and saying, are you ready to be cleansed? Are you ready to break free so that you can say wholeheartedly, here am I, send me, send me.